thin viz, which is better for that. Oh, I didn't put thin did I put thin viz up? No. Oh, I didn't do our disclosure. Look, our disclosure. Everybody agree to the disclosure. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> I forgot to do that. We were trying to get Watson has a text to speech thing. I'm dying to try that. But of course, it's IBM. So you have to set up your thing and then take some day to get back to you and blah, 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 blah. blah. Meanwhile, I would have been a happy like subscriber to their system, but they, they turn into like a nightmare to sign up. It's crazy. Um, what else? Trading. Now we know about that. Okay, good. So now I can. What did I say? I forgot FinViz. FinViz. I don't have any of my screens up because in my old computer, the screens were uh, actually Jackie. I, they, I, I set up the webinar on Jackie's account. And uh, so obviously I don't have Jackie's account on my new computer and I hopefully will not in the future. And uh, that messed me up big time. Anyways, all right, so oh, here's a good example. Look on the day chart. There's like virtually no damage done so far. I mean, these are all like rocking up, but we do have a double topish situation going on all over the place. Now, we're massively lagging. The Nikkei has been crumbling for ages. Europe has been crumbling for ages. So we're just holding up for like no freaking reason whatsoever. And, and the rest of the world sees all this trade bullshit and everything that's going on as a huge negative and they see the wheels coming off the global economy in all sorts of ways and we are so freaking oblivious it's scary it really is um i wish i could get all bullish i really do i would leave so much it's so easy to just be bullish and just go buy this buy that but i, I just i'm sorry there's just too much danger I mean, and you see that today. I mean, it, you know, it doesn't look like much here, but when you look at it, you know, when you look at the hourly chart, you know, we get this kind of drop while you, you know, this is while you're sleeping. That happened between the time the market closed and the time the market reopened. This happened. And I, it doesn't illustrate well on the chart, but it was literally, um, I, was, I was watching, um, I commented yesterday at like six o'clock. I said, holy shit, the market's just open and we're like crashing down. And I, I didn't even know what happened. And I went to look, and I see, of course, uh, you know, Trump talks about the $200 million in things. Now, keep in mind, this has all been telegraphed already because he already said we're doing $500 million. And he did 30, but he did $34 million and then another $16 million. So we're into $50 million so far. And, and we had a rally because everybody went, oh, only $50 million. That's uh, $50 billion. That's not so bad. Only $50 billion. But now he's actually getting a little more serious about the 200 billion. So here's where it was when he started talking about 500 billion. Here's where he actually put in 50 billion and we rallied. Now you're seeing that he really meant 200 billion, 250 billion at least. And this will be where we're going to be back at when we hit, if he, if he really implements 500 billion. But it'll be worse because then China's going to retaliate, so on and so forth. So I still believe. And it's way the frick down here, but I still believe this is all going to fall apart and we're going to get to 6,500 on the NASDAQ. I have no, re no reason to change my target. Is nothing has changed in the world outlook. Um, if airlines are spectacular, so airlines, if earnings, or it says airlines on CNBC, if earnings are spectacular, maybe I'll change my mind a little bit because we had good earnings last quarter. We could have good earnings this quarter. We got to look at, uh, you know, forgetting the outlook, obviously the outlook's impacted by trade. But if earnings is so good that stocks can, can get through this, then who knows? But as it stands now, I still want to be cautious. And what we should talk about is a little, so, so what I want to do today is talk about the cost of caution. That's what I want to get across today. That's my main, my main thrust of my webinar today. Let's see if anybody's got a new question. Um, okay, Latch says, any update on HMNY, Helios, Matheson, which is really movie pass and whatever? Um, no. <laughs> it hit a double down point to 20 cents, so we're, we've got a lot of them right now. It's actually below 20 cents now. Uh, the bottom line is everybody believes they're going to die. 
except for the CEO of the company and the and the and the heads of the company and the and the people who are buying more stock. They don't think it's going to die. Um, it, it's look, they might die. So you know, it's 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 fifty fifty at best. That you're throwing good money after bad by by doubling down on this stock, okay? Um, the, you know the, the same was true with Sirius when Sirius was in huge. You know Sirius had the same kind of trouble doing the same kind of thing. They were losing money, hand over fist, and on top of all that, they decided to pay Howard Stern fifty million dollars or something like that, or five. I'm sorry, like it was like five hundred million overall, but fifty million a year. They were paying Howard Stern, and they had to make huge guarantees to him because obviously he didn't know they weren't going to go bankrupt either. And he's like giving up his radio career and moving to serious and all that. So they got into this whole thing. So everybody thought they were going to be bankrupt, and we kept buying and buying and buying on the way down. And because I said, look, buying Howard Stern is a very smart move, and also their whole attitude about buying talent because they're saying talent matters on the radio. They say, you know, you can't just have a satellite radio. You have to have all the best DJs in America to, um, you know, whether you think of Howard Stern one way or another, bottom line, he has a huge audience and he's a top DJ. Um, their attitude was we want to get every good DJ in, the, in America, pay them more than they're getting paid in their current market and turn them into national people. And that's what they did. And because you know, as much as you think that, as much as it seems like it's a no talent job being a DJ on the radio or whatever, uh, there's very few people make it in the business. And it's, and they, and they grounded up all the talent and you can't just replace that talent. So they kicked the crap out of regular radio by, by basically taking all the people. Um, but it was a very expensive way to do it. And they, and they lost a ton of money for a long time and it took them ages to dig out of it, like two years. Um, Helios, You know, I, I think we talked about it last time. I don't want to get too into it. I mean, look, they have a, they have a good strategy. Their strategy is to get a, a huge amount of people that they control. And they've got three million, three and a half million right now people. They're going to have five million people by the end of the year, they say. Um, very simply, five million people spending $10 on a movie. It's fifty million dollars, so you know that a hundred million dollars is considered a blockbuster movie. So if they're controlling a block of fifty million dollars of movie spending over and over and over again, that's huge. So what have they done? So they so now obviously they, it's going to cost some money to do that, but even if it's fifty million dollars every month, that's six hundred million a year, right? And let's say everybody goes to, 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 to one movie a month. At $50 million a month, well, that, that would be even because those people are paying them $10. So basically, they'd be about even on the movies. But that's not what's happening. What's happening is people go to two, I think the number is two and a half movies each on the average. So it's costing them um, 50, uh, 612, and another three is 1.5 billion. So it's costing them 1.5 billion to send 50 million people to the movies uh, 1.5 billion after the after the 600 million they collect from those people after the, the monthlies are paid um, so the question then becomes how do they make up the 900 million dollar deficit so then you get into say well what's the value of 5 million users that you control and then Helios is a data analytics company. They say it's worth a lot. They, to them, it's worth more than uh, more than ten dollars per user. You know, they, they think it's worth well more than five hundred million dollars. Um, they are they've already uh, they didn't buy they traded stock, but they bought a studio basically. They are now they now own a studio. Um, they are going to make their own movies, and they're going to send their own people to their own movies and create instant hits. Although that did not work with Gotti, although Gotti was, you know, they had no involvement in Gotti. This is just the first one. The company they bought already was releasing Gotti as Helios was buying the company. So they had really nothing to do with it. 
Um, but it's worrisome that they were unable to send people or enough people to Gotti to, to stop it from being a failure. It got such incredibly bad press and, and, and just was hated all around. Um, but conceptually, if they do what Netflix does and make non-sucky movies, you know, based on the analytics of studying their own audience, if they make a movie that's attractive and they get their own people to go, plus bonus people, they'll make money. And, and, and there are movies that make a billion dollars. I'm not saying they're going to make them, but I'm just saying there, there are movies that make a billion dollars, and these guys could end up making hundreds of millions of dollars on movies. Plus the advertising, the analytics, everything else. They're already getting uh, film companies to pay them $4 per person who goes to a movie. And it's not just that person, but the person they invite. So if somebody goes with a date, they, they get a double credit. Um, so they're, they're, you know, so as it's a tricky thing, but it's, it's, it's just like, just like Amazon, just like Tesla, just like uh, uh, Netflix, that, you know, these companies take time to grow. The big mistake that, that, that Helios is doing is they're doing it in public. You know, Uber is losing three, four billion dollars a year, but they do it in a private company. So, no, you know, nobody sits there and, and every day criticizes what they're doing. You know, here, here they are. I mean, they're losing eight dollars a share. That's their EPS is minus eight dollars per share. That's pretty nasty. It's only a, it's only an eighteen cent share. So of course they're going down. If you buy a share, you you bought the right to lose eight dollars. So yeah, it's got a very uh, a very high chance of going bankrupt. At least fifty percent chance of going bankrupt. And you could be wasting every cent you put into this company. But I said. Our plan was going to be we would double down at 20, and we doubled down at 20 cents, which brings our average down to about 30. I think our average is like 36 cents on the on the stock. And and you know we got 10,000 shares, so it's like 3,600 bucks or something like that. Now we're now 20,000 shares. Maybe maybe we put in 7,000 dollars in the long term portfolio. Now, so having put in 7,000 dollars and having 10,000 shares or 20,000 shares. Um, why would we not buy another 20,000 shares for $2,000 if it hits a dime? It seems silly, wouldn't it? <laughs> so we're going to buy another 20, then we'll have 40,000 shares for roughly $10,000, and uh, we'll have spent um, about 40 cents. No, that doesn't make sense. I don't know, 40,000, oh no, we'll spend 25 cents a share, that's right. We'll have spent 25 cents a share. It's at 18 now, so we're gonna, you know, now it's at 18 now. We don't bring our average down to 25 cents unless it goes to 10. But right now, I'd be thrilled to have shares at only 25 cents, right? So, am I gonna be not thrilled just because it goes to 10, or am I gonna say, oh, thank God it went down, I got to buy more? You have to stick to your plan. You have to understand what your plan is and stick to it. So, we started out with about 3,500 bucks in Harmony. We bought another. So when it was like 70 cents a share or whatever, we, we bought um, 5,000 shares. We doubled down to 10,000 shares, but, all, but then the doubling down only cost us 20 cents a share. So it cost us, um, I don't know, whatever, a couple of thousand dollars to double down. So we're in for like, six, I think we're in for like $7,000 on the whole, whatever it works out to. And, um, and so we're basically at 35 cents a share on 20,000 shares. Um, and, and if we double down again, we're going to be at 25 cents a share for, for 40,000 shares. And if it goes to a buck, we'll have $40,000. And if it never goes to a buck, if it goes bankrupt, we'll have lost 10,000 bucks. That's where it is, though. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of a craft roll, but there is the possibility, slim as it may be, that this thing turns into a um, something like Netflix. And if we look at Netflix over the really long term, Max. Oh, that's not Netflix, that's Helios. And if you look at Netflix from here in 2002 to here in 2010, it's dead money. It went up, it went down, it went up, it goes down, whatever. It went up really big here, and then it crashed completely, but then finally finds its footing and takes off. So... 
and I'm not going to blow smoke up anyone's ass, but I'm just saying, if I had a chance to own 40,000 shares of Netflix for $10,000, and now I have 40,000 shares at that, which is, well, like $16 million, I believe, if I, if I get my math right. Is that right? I have zero confidence in my math right now, Ron. Not in the mood. Um, let's try to do this. 40,000 times 400. Yes, thank you. That makes me feel good. So, yes, it was 16 million. Seems like a lot. So, I'm certainly not saying that's likely. I'm just saying it has happened. So, even if it's Sixteen thousand dollars. Even if it's a hundred, you know, if it's more than sixteen thousand, I'm going to be thrilled. But will we? You know, will that happen? First of all, it's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen next week. It's not going to happen next quarter. But in a couple of years, if it turns out that they can break even and we can just get into this nice little flat thing, and we're sitting on forty thousand shares as it hovers between fifty cents and a dollar, and then all of a sudden it takes off in five, six, seven, maybe the who knows what they do? I don't know what they're going to do. I just, I just like the idea. I think it's, I think it's worth a shot, and sometimes it's worth taking a shot. Three says, uh, Phil, it's being a challenge rolling SEO fifteen calls to thirteen. Should I stay at it? Uh, do you mean you're having a hard time doing the roll? It's a little late now. Um, because because the, the 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 cheaper way to roll was when it was um higher, lower. I mean, sorry, lower. Um, that's a shame because you know I mean, you know, I, look, I, ideally. You don't have to as it's popping up now. If you didn't get it, you didn't get it, and you don't have to worry about it. But I wouldn't want to tell you to overpay. Um, you could add, like, okay, let's say you have 10 of these. Or let's say you have 10 of these uh, 15s or 13s, sorry. What was the point? <laughs> you have the 13s. Oh, no, you have the 15s. So, yeah, 10 of the 15s, we were supposed to roll them to the 13s for like a buck or something like that. Um, so now you can't do that because it's gone up a dollar, but on the other hand, you're much more in the money. Oh, man. It's on. I guess I'm on close. Oh. <laughs> so neat. That's my fault. All right, where were we? Oh, yeah. So, look, now it's going to go up. But meanwhile, you got the $13 calls. It's not killing you. It's just that it would have been nice if you would, if you would add it. What you could have done is instead of trying to roll it, and by the way, brokers, you, it's very, very hard. You can put in orders that say roll this and roll that in the, in the screen. You can say um, SEO. So you can you can have the calls. I don't know what they were in July. It's way you definitely can't roll July now. Um, but you can put in an order that says uh, if you have an existing position, you could say roll it from here to here, and you can put in a price for the net of the roll. And as you can see now, the 15s are why is this? Show me all the strikes. God's sakes. Oh, that's way too many. <laughs> <laughs> Show me 14 straight. All right. The 15s are a dollar are a dollar ten, I would say. And the 13s are two eighty an now. So it would cost it would cost um a dollar seventy to roll. That'd be ridiculous. Why would you pay that? Um the idea would have been though that when it was cheaper, you could have added some 13s and put a very tight stop on the 15s. And then as they both got higher, if they go the way you want them to go, then you could start selling some 15s at good prices. All right, and I don't know if it was July or what, but whatever it was. I mean, the, the bottom line is that there's, you know, it, 
if you wait for the broker to fill you, they're not going to fill you. The only way the broker is going to fill you is if they get a good price themselves internally because they want to make a nickel. And, they, and, and that's their attitude. When you, when you put in the spread order, they're not going to fill you unless they're, unless they're internal market guys can make a nickel off the, off the filling. Why would, they, why, would they, why would they fill you for free? There are plenty of people who are willing to pay dumb prices for everything else. And that is how brokers work. They fill the dumbest orders first because if they, if they can scrape money off your account, they do. And they'll tell you they don't, but that's what they do all the time. That's how it's where most of their uh, fee money comes from. It's from just a bid ad spread. You put in, you know, there, there are people all the time who put in a, a, a market order. Probably 75, 80% of the people who trade put in market orders, which is the stupidest way to trade. And they'll put in a market order, which means they're going to pay about 25 for this call, even though the only other person offering is paying one. The only offer down there is 105. That's what this means. You know, wait, let me move this. Slide. You guys don't, can't see it, but I can. So there's a bid. Somebody's bidding a dollar five. Somebody's asking a dollar 25. Nothing is transacting in between. There's no filling. This one you can see is filling. It's moving. You can see it filling. This one's not moving because it's such a wide spread. So if I was going to put in an offer there, I would offer 115. You know, if I really wanted, I wouldn't. I would never pay 125. But there, but that that puts me way behind the queue because they're going to fill all the people who want to pay 125 are going to get filled first. And only if somebody who's asking to sell the stock is going to, to sell the option is going to capitulate. Is am I going to get my fill? But I would rather wait because I know that things go up and they go down, they go up and they go down constantly. So I'll just wait for a down for a swing that goes in my way. But if you're if you're asking to fill a spread, they both have to go your way at the same time. The chance of that happening is very, very slim. So I always break up my orders and fill them in pieces. It's very, very hard to get a good fill otherwise. <clears throat> All right, let's say. Brendan says, why are the metals falling so hard, silver and gold? Why shouldn't the tariffs be inflationary and therefore bullish? Because the tariffs are negative to the economy in general. <laughs> they diminish the uh, need for international trade. They also strengthen the dollar, which makes, um, you know, the, the tariffs strengthen the dollar. Because we're changing, we're shifting our balance of trade in theory. That we can improve our balance of trade, which will create a larger demand for dollars. At the moment, we do have a, you know, 500 billion or whatever it is trade deficit, right? That means that we push out $500 billion bills in exchange for stuff. So the world gives us stuff. I think our trade balance overall must be 800 billion, not five, whatever it is, it's a huge number. But the world gives us stuff and we give them dollars. So that makes a huge supply of dollars in the world. That weakens a dollar. If we fix our trade deficit, and I'm not saying that anything that Trump is doing is gonna fix anything, but the theory is if we fix the trade deficit, then we push less dollars into the world. And because people want to buy U.S. goods and services in the balanced trade, then that means that there will be more demand for dollars to pay for the services and the goods from the United States. So that will increase the demand for dollars at the same time as it takes away supply of dollars internationally. All that obviously bad for commodities, which are priced in dollars. But that's all that happens. It's nothing about, there's no negativity in demand for silver and gold. There's nothing uh, outside of the inflationary context, although inflation has been persistently low. And, uh, and also there's no fear hedge right now in the market that's pushing people in the middles as an ultimate uh, source. Plus, I mean, the biggest thing that's keeping metal down lately, and I mean, last year, year or two, is that the same kind of people who invest in gold and silver invest in bitcoins and things. 
So it's sort of um, diluting the pool of money available for metals um, as an ultimate resource. You know, that's all it is. I mean, there's no value. Uh, there, there's, value there's value to gold, but the value of gold industrially is nothing like 12, 15 ounces. Uh, the value of silver industrially is nothing like $16 an ounce. So, um, I mean, obviously some industries pay, pay what they're forced to pay, but it doesn't have this value that they say, oh, I'd pay so much more if it was hard. You don't know. People look to, look to find alternatives to gold. Um, I remember back in the day when gold was cheap, um, they were gold plating everything. They were gold plating all these stereo plugs and things like that. Um, because they and, they and they used to tell you, it's so funny, they used to tell you, oh, if you don't have gold plating, then, then you can't possibly be getting the best sound quality, blah, 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 blah. Nowadays, they don't have gold slating. I and I just asked the guy, I just I just redid the stereo, and I asked the guy, I said, what about all those gold things? And he's like, oh, that's all bullshit. Because <laughs> they don't have it, so they, now it's bullshit. It's like it's such it's so ridiculous. Um, if they whatever they have is the thing to have, and whatever they don't have is all bullshit. Um, and that goes for the currency people too. I mean, everybody's hoarding gold and hoarding silver. Um, you know, bitcoins are easier to hoard even though there's a terrible spread on them. Um, so would I take a stab at these levels? Yes, 1250, I just said this morning that um, that gold at 1250 is really kind of my, my bottom line for gold. And silver down around here is too, but silver can take a dangerous dip on you. And let's get back to that um, futures. I gotta close the chat window, boom, boom, boom. So you guys can't see anything. I'm just randomly moving my mouse around. All right, uh, metal. As you can see, we get really nice bounces. Now, I don't want to play gold above. I'm sorry, below. Below 1250, I don't want to be in gold. I want to buy gold when it hits 1250 and take it with a stop at 1250. It can easily go back up to 1360, and that's like you know a thousand bucks of this of a move. Um, silver. Uh, it's like fifty dollars a penny or something. Some incredibly large amount of money. It's a very dangerous contract to play with, but down around here, fifteen eighty, really good place to play. I mean, anything getting around fifteen eighty, but it can go to fifteen fifty. You need to be aware of that. So unless you have a, an ironclad stomach, you really be, have to be super careful around here. So if you're going to get in here, you either have to have very tight stops or you have to say, oh, I'll be very happy to double down at 15. If it goes below 15, I'll double down again. And, and then you've got to be prepared to wait and wait and wait for it to come back. Because you don't know how long these things are going to last. Look what happened here. 10. You know, but at but 10, you back up the truck and buy it. I mean, we did that. We were, we were buying these kind of things here. Um, you, you know, you don't know how long they're going to last. So these can go down and stay down for ages. They can go down for a little bit and stay down. Um, you know, they, they, we thought 20 was going to bottom out. It didn't have a whole new thing at 15 now. And if 15 goes down to 10, we'll have that. You know, but at a certain point, there is a certain point at which it is, you'll start, people would rather use silver for industrial processes than other things they're using that aren't quite as good. Um, gold, too. Like I said, when gold when gold was two fifty an ounce, they were gold plating everything. They were gold plating flowers. <laughs> I used to have music and gold roses, like gold dipped roses. They still have them, but you know, it was a thing for a while. Where lots of people were like sitting around. Oh, like half the women I knew had gold dipped roses in their cases. Um, you know, that it's just somebody was saying gold roses because there was so much of it around. But now it's you know now it's twelve fifty. It's a big difference. Somebody's buying that. Um, I mean, super rich people buy anything, but whatever. So anyhow, now copper, also a demand metal, but the problem with copper is <clears throat> there are massive, massive, massive Chinese stockpiles of copper. Copper is one of the most used uh, commodities to back up Japanese corporate debt. So in other words, all these companies in China have warehouses filled with copper, uh, one of the reasons they like that is because it's very easy to fake the count of copper because it's so bulky 
that it's hard to get an accurate count. Um, you know, like you look at a, you know, you look across these warehouses filled with plates and plates and plates, but the bottom stack is like it's like when you put a stacks of, of, of hundred dollar bills, but in the middle is a bunch of white paper that's not hundred dollar bills, but you have no way of knowing that unless you dig through all of it. China kind of the Chinese companies kind of do that with, with copper and they use this collateral for their loans. So the banks are like, you know, the banks don't care. They only they, they, they just want an excuse to write it down. This, this is, by the way, the problem with um, state-controlled uh, capitalism, because, you know, the, the banks are only following the rules to make the government happy, not to make their shareholders happy. So they, they're only kind of like, they, they're just checking a box to say, yes, customer has a big warehouse full of copper that we are using as collateral. Uh, but they can't do no collateral, so they have to pretend there's some collateral. So as long as the business wants to pretend there's collateral, the bank is happy to pretend there's collateral, and that's how it works. So meanwhile, lots and lots and lots of copper sitting in warehouses in China. Now, if these companies start defaulting, and the only asset that the bank can grab is whatever copper there really is in these warehouses, what's the bank going to do with it? They don't want to hold it. It's not an investment for them. They want to dump it. So at any given time, massive amounts of copper can get dumped on the market like this, which I warned about at the time in 2008. In these years, I said copper is, is going to get the coppers in trouble because of China. And that's exactly what happened. And then it kind of has been went down again, made a little resurgence here. It's probably tracking back to 250 though. I like copper here. I said at 275, I would play it, but very, very tight stuff. You don't know where the bottom's gonna be, but you'd like to be there when it when it hits, because copper pays big. But you've got to be super tight with stuff. You cannot afford to ride this out. This is too much money. So you don't want to be stuck in this. At 250, you try it again with tight stops. At 225, you try it again with tight stops. At two dollars, I would start to have conviction. Two dollars is too cheap. But it's hard to have conviction over that. <laughs> Uh, Sri says, I didn't execute the rule. The max lowest difference was 105 and currently at 130. Wow. So 105, I would have paid the nickel. Um, oil down 250, Scott SCO looking good. Yeah. So Brian says our oil is looking good. And that's a little weird too, because today they had, um, you know, they had a 12 million barrel drawer in oil. That's not, that. oh no, I'm sorry. Look at the long, long term chart. Yeah, wow. It's ugly. That's great for SEO though. Look, it, it doesn't matter why it went down. The bottom line was they had the big, big push into the 4th of July, and that's it. They shot their wad, and now it's uh, now it's going to fade out. There's no natural reason oil should be this high. And I said yesterday in chat, I said, look, <clears throat> oil's only at $74. And that's with Iran sanctions and Libya having shut down production and a North Sea strike in oil and the Trump's trade war shit and all this crap. It's you know it's like how many possible catalysts could they have? Oh, and, and everybody in the Saudi Ramco thing that's dead by the way. At the moment, that's dead. Saudi Ramco cannot go public even at one trillion, which is half of what they wanted. Nobody wants it because they have more oil than they are likely to use over the long term. We will stop using oil before the Saudis run out of oil. And I don't mean stop, stop, because we're still gonna make stuff with, with oil, like there's still chemical reasons to use oil and stuff and things. But as far as as an energy source, it'll be, it, you know, the Saudis have probably 50, 60 years of oil on the ground, 40 something years of oil on the ground, but at the most, you know, if you're at the biggest, uh, whatever you call it, the biggest demand projection, the Saudis still have 40, oh, well over 40 years of oil on the ground. Realistically, demand is declining. They probably have 60 years of oil in the ground at the current demand curve down, but that is going to accelerate. And uh, we will stop using oil as soon as there's a major advance in battery technology and electricity, and then fusion is going to completely kill it. And we will have fusion probably uh, 20, what year is it? 20, 20, yeah, I'd say 10 years, 12 years at the outside, 2030. We'll have fusion. 
and that's going to change everything. I'll save the world, frankly. I only hope we I only hope we have fusion before Trump gets a chance to destroy everything. That's my theory. So, and I don't I don't want to be destroying things so badly that having having almost unlimited free energy is going to change that. Um, but meanwhile, so so the bottom line is, I believe that within 20 years there will be virtually no need for oil at all. That's that's where my head is on this thing, and that means, and I'm not the only one because obviously because the Saudis can't sell a company whose entire asset is all the oil in the world. Basically, they I mean not all, but you know they've got such a significant amount of oil, they've got such a huge supply that's the asset of Saudi Aramco, and nobody wants it. And not nobody, but you know, I'm sure, I'm sure your uncle is telling you how great the idea is, but um, nobody with uh, nobody with two hundred billion dollars to give them at a two trillion dollar valuation wants it. It's not happening. They can't round up enough people to get an interest in an IPO, and that's messed up. That is really messed up, and it's a huge problem for the Saudis. It's going to cause all kinds of instability down the road because they really needed that money. Um, and, and it's not just the electric cars because I, I have these arguments with people all the time where they go, well, there's no way we're going to have that many electric cars that quickly. It's not that. It's that the cars are getting more fuel efficient. We're getting lighter and lighter materials to make things out of. Um, there's, there's better and faster ways of doing public transportation. Not You wouldn't know it in America, but in other countries, they have trains that go really, really fast all over the place, and people take them instead of cars because they're better. And they take them instead of planes because they're better. And trains use very, very little energy, actually. They're really efficient. Um, and usually electric. So there's going to be, you know, if you sold um, hay, right, in the 1900s, and imagine like hay would be oil, and they have, okay, the, the first car comes along in 1903, and there's a few cars, and then in 1905, there's some more cars, in 1910, there's some more cars. Meanwhile, you're the hay guys, and you're like, oh, this is, this is a fad, the horse is a horse, of course, of course, you know, it's, it's never going to fade out, people are always going to want to fall back on the more reliable horses. And you always know that you can get, you know, you can always go the distance in a horse and so on and so forth. All the same kind of bullshit arguments to say that the new modern stuff isn't going to last. And they just keep making their hay and they stay in the hay business and they consolidate the hay business and, they, and whatever. But the bottom line is in 1920, how many people are left? This, this 17 years after the first car, how many people didn't have a car in 1920? How many people were still riding horses? 1920, they were gone. 20 years, everybody in America went from a horse to a car. Electric cars haven't even been around for 10 years and only small prototype, blah, blah, blah. The next 10 years, you're gonna have a massive change in the fleet and the next 10 years after that, you're gonna pretty much eliminate electric, uh, you're gonna eliminate um, internal combustion engines. So in, within 20 years, it'll be gone. There'll be no cars using uh, using uh, oil, and there'll be no, uh, and, and that goes for buses and probably trucks too. It's just gonna be gone. It'll be a thing we used to use that we don't use anymore. And then 20 years after that, everybody's gonna be like, can you believe we used to use oil to run a car? How silly. But that, that's what doomed Aramco, and, that's what's, and, that, and ultimately that's what's dooming oil. It's insane. That you can that, that you would even be asked to pay seventy four dollars, and uh, we talked about the, what they call backwardation in, in the uh, long term thing, where you can you can currently right now by the July 2020, 2021 oil contracts for like sixty bucks. And I said yesterday, I said you can short the crap out of the front month and buy the July as a buffer because you know at some point hopefully oil will pop back up and your and your long calls will be worth something. But meanwhile, you could I said that yesterday. I said you can short oil with uh, abandon because that the front month oil was the way to go and to short that. I said that in yesterday's post too. 
So now it's up three thousand five. It's a three thousand five hundred dollar drop in two days. Uh, it, this this was bullshit. It was bullshit into the holiday. They kept it up as long as they can, but it eventually falls apart. There was no possible number they could come up with in today's inventory report that would justify seventy five dollar oil, and so it died. Uh, okay, that's that question. Three says September. Oh, I see September things. Oh, that's that's an easy roll. Um, what do you think of JJ off the coffee? Oh, that's a new uh, coffee thingy. I, the, look, the last one was a disaster, so I don't think anything of the new one. Um, and there's no way we know how bad the decay is until we watch it for a while. Is it new? I thought it was new. Uh, maybe that's some old kind. Anyway, look, I mean, look, look at the steady, steady downturn. And coffee doesn't go down that much. So, so you still have some seriously bad decay. Um, you always want to look at that. Look at the actual commodity over the same kind of time period. Days. All right. So coffee went from 145 to 115. So that's 30 into 145 is like 20% down. All right. So coffee's down about 20%. And JJ off is down from 24 to 12. It's down 50%. So it's losing money or losing value 50, uh, two and a half times faster than the underlying commodity. So do I like it? No, it's horrible. That's horrible. Look, you can do this yourself. It's very easy to calculate. From here, oh, and that's and actually the time frame is a lot lower. From August of uh, last year, 145 to now, 150, let's say 115, so 30, and we'll call that 20%. So that's your basis, is 20% from last August. And you go here and you say, okay, where were we last August? Oh, we weren't that bad. It was 19 and you're down to 13. So that's six into 19. So it's not, not that terrible. It's um, about 30%. So 20%, 30%, so it's 50% worse decay on this. So the longer you hold it, the faster it's going to go down. That's all there is to it. It's not going to go up faster. It's only going to go down faster. So, so it's not a good way to bet. It's only, I mean, look, it's the only reason you're betting this is because you can't bet futures. If you can bet futures, you shouldn't be touching that thing. Oh, speaking of futures, look at these indexes. Um, trade. And everybody sank back down. I, I, it's not a good day to play. There's too much rumors and crap driving the market. Trump could talk at any time. You never know what's going on right now. So that's bad. Which brings me to my point of the day, which is looking at the top trade review. <clears throat> so I did the top trade review this morning because I, I want to, you know, I knew we were doing the webinar, so I wanted to talk about it. Um, We, we, we got to talk more about the basics. So let's talk about the basics, okay? These are the top trades. They go out uh, up right here. Anybody who's a member can click on that and see the top, trade, the top trades. They look like this. Cisco web extension is disabled. Well, I know what that is. Why are you doing this to me? WebEx. Well, actually, can you are you guys still on? Is everything good? I'm more into that. That's, um, somebody say hello. One person, anybody. Just so I know you're there. Oh. Am I by myself? <laughs> oh, thank you, Brian. Boy, it's getting paranoid. All right. All right, cool. All right, so we'll keep going. I, I, I just suddenly worried that Cisco WebEx had something to do with the webinar. Um, what was I talking about? Ah, yeah, this is what a top trade, the top trade section looks like. Of course, you guys get these by email if you signed up for the top trade alerts. 
if you're not signed up, see where it says Phil's account right here? So you guys all have that. So you click on your account and it's gonna, uh, it'll say to you like, would you like to get top trade alerts? And you click, yes, I would. And you'll get top trade alerts. As long as you're a subscriber above, I think anybody above the report level gets them, as far as I understand. Because right, we have report members and we have top trade members. So obviously they get top trades. Then we have um, trend watcher members. I'm pretty sure they get top trades. Definitely basic and premium members get top trades. So that's what I, that's my understanding is that everybody gets top trades except the people who are only report members. So anyway, I send them out when I feel like it. Um, in my mind, the top trade is one that has a higher than average percentage chance of winning. So we talk about trades all the time. I put trades in the long-term portfolio and the short-term portfolio all the time, in the options opportunity portfolio also. Um, but a top trade to me is one that has a very, very high probability of success. So that's what a top trade is for me. Um, so in my mind, when I put out a top trade alert, it's because I think this is a very strong likelihood of being a winner. That's my primary criteria. And also, I like the ones that I don't feel have to be watched, given the nature of how we, um, how we barely look at the top trades, except for these reviews, which are six months after the fact, generally. So anyway, but that's, that's how they're meant to be. They're not meant to be heavily played with. They're supposed to be trades you put in your portfolio, forget about, look back and see how it's doing sometime down the road. So this week, was it this week? Yeah, this week. We added Mondelez, but it was a butterfly edition, in fact. Um, then uh, the week before, we had uh, the, the Walgreens boots. Oh, I was dying. That was fantastic. Walgreens boots fell down to, to 60, and we jumped all over that because that was stupid. Um, we had Royal Caribbean also popped up nicely, and uh, Citibank. I don't know what's happened to Citibank. This is 22nd of June. We did the SEO trade that people are talking about. Um, these are our money talk trades, which I'm going to be updating um, next week. Let's see how many how's money talk today. I remind me to look. It was 85% then. It's probably better now. Um, it's a lot of top trades, actually. <laughs> what a good deal. Uh, we had DXD hedge, obviously not doing well, I'm sure, but but the point is it was a hedge. Um, Qcom, Qualcomm. OLED and GE, OLED, well, it's not that bad. I mean, they, they went down a bit, but not that bad from June. Oh, this is May 20th, way, way over here. Yeah, not, not down a little bit, but not terrible. GE, still terrible, but not, not worse than it was here. That's where they were in May. Anyway, ETM, wow, where did I pull that one out? Look at that, nice. It was good timing. So right about here, we got into ETM. It was good. Good bottom call got a little bit worse before it got better, but it, got, it was good. And uh, TA show is drifting along. Anyhow, so the point is we don't really check them very often. These are way too soon. I would never even want to look at them as far as officially. But the point is there's lots and lots of top trades. <laughs> it doesn't seem like a lot. It's like once a week. But, but when you look back and say, wow, we lost trades in one month. It's quite a lot. Um, anyhow, so that's what the top trades look like. And what do we say we're going to do? Look at the... Uh, Money to our portfolio. Um, next Wednesday, I'm on. Oh, next Wednesday is going to be, oh, 87. It fell back. Next Wednesday, I'm on, and we're going to make a lot of changes to the money to our portfolio next week. So, um, in fact, just this morning, I was saying I would have gotten out of uh, WPM, I think, is, is, is too, too far in the money to keep up at this point. So, I don't need it. Apple, we, you know, the reason we like Apple to stay in, even though it's mostly matured, is look 90% on the puts. But we have like virtually zero fear of losing that money. So we'll see what happens. Anywho, so we're going to add trades to Money Talk next Wednesday, big day, because I'm doing the show at night um, on Wednesday. And then during the day, we'll talk about the trades and what we're expecting to do that night. So it's going to be. Um, a big day for this portfolio, so money to our portfolio. Um, anyhow, where was I? Oh yeah, top trade reviews. So, 
A trade about once a week. They're they're generally the kind of trades that you would call set and forget. It's supposed to be um you know just just this is a trade. By next year we expect to make this much money. End of story. And 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 obviously some go up and some go down. They're not all winners. But as of um as of uh, now this is going through 2017. So into October of 2017. So for the first 10 months. Of 2017, we're almost done with the year. We have we had 40 winners and six losers. 86.9% winning streak through for the first 10 months of the year. And just the September October trades as of today, as of July 11th. So not you know nine months later. Yeah, call it nine months later. So nine months later, fifty in just two months, fifty-nine thousand dollars in profit. So you know that's why. I mean, I, I want to go over that to make you pay attention, because what we're doing here is nothing like gambling. Well, it all starts a little like gambling, but I mean, it's not. We're not gambling. We're doing the entire be the house thing. We're selling a lot of premium. We're patient money investors. We're taking a position in a stock that we don't mind having assigned to us because we'd love to own the stock cheaply. And from that, we then sit and wait. So with Apple, for example, on September 6th, here was the trade. Apple was way, see, see 150 here? It was down around here in September. And we were conservative, but I said, look, I, I got to put my foot down. When Apple's down around 150, and I can sell the 140 puts for nine bucks, or I come in at, at 130, which is down here, my net would be about 131. That's a no-brainer for me. But why is it a no-brainer? Because I'm a value investor, because I look at Apple and say, yeah, of course, I'd love to own Apple for 130, and I don't give a crap if it goes to 100. Because it's still worth 130. I don't care what it goes to. There's a difference between value and price. And and price, you know, TA people, price people drive the market. Every analyst out there, not every, but almost every analyst out there, has price targets, right? They don't have value targets, they have price targets. It's not the same thing. Most analysts, 90% of the analysts out there, 95% of the analysts out there are not fundamentalists. They are technical analysts and they're trend followers. If something's going up, they think it'll go higher. If something's going down, they think it'll go lower and they look for reasons to justify what they see on a chart. But when you talk to these guys, which I do in a bar, you find out that really it's because the squiggly lines look like they're going up, so it must be good. And then I read this, and that means it must be true because it looks like that's good. Like Tesla, right? Like I talked to these guys who are Tesla who do who who are paid big money to analyze Tesla, and they and they go, oh well, a lot of targets like five hundred. Like why five hundred? Well, it's going up like twenty percent a year, so of course it's going to be at five hundred. They've been going, you know, like it's been going up for 10 years. Why wouldn't it go up again 20%? I'm like, uh, maybe because $500 would be completely insane. Because $500 would be an 80 something billion, $85 billion valuation on a car company that's losing $2 billion a year. And they're like, ah, oh, pish tosh. You know, like, no, no they're, they're going to have this and that. Like, this bullshit Elon Musk did this weekend. Um, you know, the Thai kids were trapped in a cave and professional divers, like SEAL Team 6 kind of guys from Thailand were getting them out and were, were putting together a thing to get them out. So Elon Musk, without being asked, obviously, spends the weekend with his engineering team making a little submarine 
which is not really even a submarine. It's basically a freaking tube with air in it. Not, it's not even a tube with air in it. It's a tube. Every tube has air in it. If you close it, and there's air. Okay, that's not tube with air. There's really, there's no moving parts to his thing at all. It's basically a capsule you put a guy in. It, it was something you would put together. It's, it's something that your kids would do to, as a science project. So it was like, not, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't even get an A. It just was all it was the freaking metal capsule that you stick a kid in, and then the divers were supposed to move them around. And the benefit of it was it was really small, but it was really small because they made it just so tight that it was like a horrifying coffin for the kid. Um, and, and the Thai government was like, and the, and the SEAL guys were like, we, we don't want or need that, so stop. And of course, Elon Musk sends it over there anyway, where it doesn't get used, and they already had the kids out of the cave by the time it came. And when they looked at it, they said, well, this isn't going to help at all. It's got nothing to do with what we want or need. Um, and, and meanwhile, so Musk is wasting time, resources, blah, blah, blah. But why does he do it? It's a distraction. It makes you think he's a problem solver. He's not a problem solver. He didn't solve anything. He just annoyed people. Um, it, it, was, it was just ridiculous because there was no way, timing-wise, he was going to be able to help. And, and that solution, it, he, and, he, and also he makes a solution sitting in his desk in California for, for people in Thailand without actually saying, that, what, what can we do to help? That would have been nice. Like, what could we actually do to help? You know, like, how about deliver state-of-the-art diving suits or something like that, or like give us supplies and things that we need, rather than just deciding, I'm going to give you a big metal tube. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Anyway. So, you know, to, I, I think Tesla, I, I said before, I think Tesla is a huge pawn and it's going to unravel and take the market with it. I, I think it's going to make people rethink a lot of NASDAQ pricing. Um, don't know when, though, you know, it's, 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 so he gets away with it because he's really good at publicity. We'll see. But anyhow, so Apple, so I think. So here's the stock. I definitely want to own it for 130. So we're happy to make a commitment. So we make that commitment. We set a target that we think is reasonable. And all we did was take the 150. It was probably 150 at the time. We took the 150, 165 bull call spread. So that's back when it was here. I said, I, my target is 165 by 2020. I know it was conservative. But I like conservative plays. And you know what it is? Here's a conservative play that costs $6,100 in cash and pays $30,000, so practically a $24,000 profit, 400%. And all Apple has to do is go to 165. So if I can make 400% with a massively conservative play on Apple, why would I want to make a, a less conservative play? And as you can see, we're super deep in the money now. Um, the spread is already $25,200, so it only has $4,800 left to make. But $4,800 in six months is 19% on what's left. On the $25,000, it's 19%. On the original $6,000, it's 75% more. Um, so even though, but, but then, you know, every time you have to look at it realistically, you say, well, I could cash it now and get 25.2 out of the trade. So why am I tying up 25.2? You don't say I can make another 75% because the reality is now you've got 25.2 at risk. Before we only had 6,000 at risk. Now I have 25.2 at risk. Um, and I say at risk because I don't consider owning Apple for 130 a risk or 140. Um, but that's not, I don't consider that an additional risk. I consider that a gift. I consider that like I'm thrilled to have it. Um, and that's what value investing is about, though. It's about, you know, I actually want the stocks I trade. I want to own them long term. I don't end up owning them long term most of the time because we're right and the stock goes up and we get called away. That's fine. And I get cash. I like cash too. Anyway, so. We've got a huge gain, and the reason we're not taking this one off the table is because $4,800 on $25,000 in six months is 19%, and we've got tons of cash. We don't need this money, so why wouldn't we take 19% interest on the money? 
That's all. It's, it's as good as cash because we have zero fear that Apple's going to go below 140 or, or even below 165, really. It's very unlikely to happen. So I'd rather leave my money here and let it collect 19% interest than, um, than cash it in. Um, <clears throat> limited brands was another one that was our trade of the year. And again, super conservative. This is still back in September. Um, oh, it's the same day, September, whatever it was. Anyways, it's back here in September. The stock is here. And what do we sell? The 3250 puts way down here. So when the stock's up here, we sell the puts way down here, probably a 20% discount at least. And we take the 20, the 3250 calls. Now they're expensive. They were 750 because they were in the money. But we took the 3250 calls because they have very low premium. We don't want to buy premium. We want to sell premium. So we take the calls that have a, a very low amount of premium, and then we sell calls that have a high amount of premium, the $40 calls. So LB was at 40. So these calls were all premium. Our 3250 calls with LB at 40 had practically zero premium, and the puts were all premium. So we sold $9 worth of premium and bought no premium. We bought a position. So we bought a position with virtually no premium, sold $9 worth of premium. What do we know for sure? The only thing you know for sure in the market is that all premium expires worthless. So on this trade, we were guaranteed to get nine dollars by the time the premium by the time these calls expired and that's only january this year of the uh, coming up um it was a fact and how much was that that's 17 plus 9 is 26 so almost twenty seven thousand dollars that we were guaranteed to collect that means that since we're guaranteed to collect twenty seven thousand, our net on the 30 is like three thousand dollars so what we really did is we bought the 3250 calls for $3,000, which is not even a dollar per contract. So what did we do? We went long LB at 3350, even when the stock was at 40. I want to be very clear about that. The stock was at 40, and we went long at 3350. All it has to do is not fall, and we make money. Even if it does fall 10% to 36, we still make money. And not, not a little money, quite a lot of money. Because our break even is 33.50. And above that, we make at 36, we make about $12,000. That's ridiculous. The stock drops 10% and we make $12,000. As it stands now, our spread is up $8,000, but we're going to get the full $26,000 we expect. There's no reason not to expect it because all we have to do is hit 40, hit 40 by the end of the year, and we think that's very likely, unless, of course, our market collapses. Um, but, you know, given that if that doesn't happen, then, then this should be a great trade. But this is what I mean by set and forget. We did not... I didn't buy Netflix for $400. I didn't buy Tesla for $360. I'm not chasing anything high in the channel. And I'm making 400% returns. So why would I even consider chasing after high-flying momentum stocks with high PEs? Where's my advantage? Why, why do you do, you know, why do you guys do it? I, I, again, I, I said that down here, somewhere in there, I wrote, I don't understand why I, I have so much trouble getting people to do this stuff. I don't, you know, it's, 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 not, it's not sexy, it's boring. It's so boring that this is the first time we've reviewed this in nine months. Nine months ago, we made this trade. It went way the frick up and way the frick down, and now it's over here, and it doesn't matter. We could have actively traded it. We could have done something with it, and we, probably, and we did in our other portfolios where we were more active. This isn't a portfolio. These are just trade ideas and what they were meant to set and forget. And the thing I'm trying to emphasize in these top trade reviews is that you don't 
have to trade constantly. Just pick good stocks and leave them alone. This is how Warren Buffett became a billionaire, just doing this. And it's not hard. Oh, and you know what else is funny about it? Like, like September or whatever was a, um, obviously it was a down dip on the market at the time. That's the other thing, you wait for a good dip. That's why there's four trades in one day. You wait for a nice dip and then you make your trades. So IMAX, same thing, okay, in, this is in September, so IMAX is around 23 bucks, and we sell the 10% out of the money puts, and we buy the 18 calls and sell the 22 calls. That's an in-the-money spread. So our trend idea in IMAX is that it's not going to fall more than a buck or two. That's not bullish, but it doesn't have to be bullish because it makes 540% if IMAX simply doesn't go down. Those are the kind of trades I like. And they, got, and they should be the kind of trades you like. That's what your portfolio should be full of. You know, I mean, a lot, a lot of times, I mean, people come to me in the chat room and they, and they propose trades. And, there's nothing, and you know, look, it's great proposing the trades, but my main correction for them is always to say, you know what, instead of trying to spend zero, because that's the, the tendency of an options trader when they're learning is to say, okay, hey, how can I spend zero money and make money? But it's not about what you spend. It's about your likelihood of winning. And like I said, these are 86% successful. They have a high likelihood of winning. And if you're 86% successful by laying, by, by, by spending the money to take a good position, that beats the crap out of being 40% successful, even 60% successful by spending no money. Here, boy, a lot of people are calling me. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Um, it's not a market, it seems like it's steady. Let's see. All right, so that was just one day that we we're looking at. The other one was uh, what was that last one? Was um, wheat and precious metals that went flying now. That's interesting because silver is crashing and wheat is still pretty strong, so we'll see if they stay that way. Um, See, now the thing about wheat, though, if you think about it, is they, they, they sell, they have contracts to buy and sell silver. So actually, it's really to their advantage. If silver is crashing in prices, they already sold contracts. So they're going to be, but what they do is they arbitrage it. So right now, they're probably buying the crap out of silver contracts long term, and they'll wait until it comes back and start selling them again. But meanwhile, they're fulfilling all their, all their higher silver contracts they can fulfill at low prices. And it's not, they don't have to, it's not gambling. They already sold the silver for $20 plus. For months and months and months, they were selling contracts at $20 plus. The minute it hits 16, they fill all the contracts. Not some. They don't have to bet, they don't need to bet on it going any lower to win. They're going to win $4 a contract by locking it in now. Now, the only danger they have then is to say, okay, what do we want to do now that, we've, now that we have this big cash out? What's the next move? Do we want to take, now they think maybe we want to take a risk. We'll buy several months worth of silver for 16 bucks, and we're going to wait a bit before we start selling contracts again and get a bounce. But that's what these guys do. That's their silver traders. That's what they do for a living, and they're good at it, so I like to invest in them. Then we have this SEO trade that lost $8,000. They don't all win. That's your risk. Now, what do we mean by an $8,000 loss? It's because we sold the we sold the puts, the 35 puts, and in November, it was down to 27. So we took an $8,000 loss on the puts. Now, in reality, what we did is we turned this into a different kind of play, and we actually came out okay. But... 
without, you know, again, we just a snapshot. We're going back nine months later and looking at it and saying, oh, that's, that one just basically didn't work. It was a loss. Um, Target, stupidly cheap. I, I You can read the write-up here. It was stupidly cheap. I listed why I thought it was stupidly cheap. We bought it, and it went flying up. Simple. 337%. Here's Barrett Gold. I still like them. They're a loss right now. So that means that means this trade is cheaper or better than what we came in at. And I still like them going forward when gold recovers. And that's why it's good to do these reviews because sometimes they say, oh, wow, I forgot about that one. You know, here's one that's fantastic if you want to put some gold in your portfolio. IBM, also stupidly cheap at 140. Anytime it's under 150, it's a good buy. So, and again, that, it's up a little bit but it has huge potential, so it's a great trade still. William Sonoma, also stupidly cheap. I talked about how it was an old favorite as we used to like to play it. It got cheap again, so we jumped back in. Like a no-brainer. And again, here it was in September, or October, I'm sorry, it was October by then. Um, it's at $50, and what do we do? We sell the $40 puts. So we sold, puts that were 20% out of the money for another 10%. So now it's going to be 30% off before we even buy them. And that's from what we consider a too low price of 50. So again, this is not risky. Or it's not risky. It's not risky if you have a long-term portfolio and you intend to own stock in it and you pick stocks that have long-term values that you wish to own. Then the, then the downside risk, which is owning the stock, is not a really a big risk at all. And then you can just put it in your portfolio and look back nine months later and go, oh, look, that one worked out. What do you know? Or if it doesn't work out, you go, hey, look, I own William Sonoma. <laughs> it's not a bad outcome. I'm not gonna complain about owning William Sonoma at 35 bucks. It's never going to bother me. I don't care if it's at 20 when I get it at 35. I'm going to say, oh, you know what? I'm going to double down at 20, and now I've got it for um, 27.50 average. And how is that bad? Is that bad? No. Because I can sell the crap out of calls and puts and make that money back in five minutes. It's like chess. There's a move and another move and another move. And if you know that and you understand it, you almost never get burned. But again, these are just setting and forgetting. We're not even talking about adjusting. But but the adjustments are, are easy enough to make too. Here's Whirlpool. They are a little affected by the tariffs. Um, cost of steel is bad for them. But overall, they also affected by uh, Sears. They lost their relationship there. But overall, it's a good stock. It's, it's up a little bit, but it could be up a lot more. Gilead, very cheap, great price right now. We only made 75 bucks, so this trade is basically exactly where it was when we started. Celgene, also down. So again, also where we started on the Celgene trade. And by the way, that's what we count as not working out. We have a trade down, down 400 bucks, and that counts, as a, that counts as one of our losses. Although 75 counts as a win, so I guess it's the same thing. But, Point, point being that, you know, it's not, it's not critical. And the bottom line is in the two months, we made $50, $59,000. Not on risky trades. We're not going for broke here. Um, generally, we're making position sizes that are, that are, that are suitable for $100,000 portfolios. That's, you know, usually what I'll put up in a, in a, um, in a top trade. Of course, I don't always realize it's a top trade at the time. So I have to go back and uh, and back the, the amounts, but usually I'll put in the amounts that is suitable for a um, fifty four hundred thousand dollar portfolio. And more and more when we do trades, I put amounts because I find that it's really uh, people don't relate very well to to just saying um, you know one contract to this and one contract to that. People like to see an amount. So you know most amounts I do with a hundred thousand dollar portfolios, unless somebody specifies that they want something bigger or smaller. All right, let's see what else. Nobody has any questions. Really? Come on, guys. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, maybe, maybe, wait a second. Oh, maybe there are some questions. Let me see. Yes, hello. Oh, I got a bunch of people said hello all of a sudden. All right. Um, 
<laughs> you guys, it's like I'm asking and asking, and then all of a sudden everybody chimes in. It's weird. Uh, maybe this is delay. Ah, Albert gave you the location of the uh, files. Thank you, Albert. I appreciate that. Um, please fill on GE. Can we shoot for some income out of our? Out, wait, can we shoot for some income out of our position? Um, if you mean the GE that's in. Um, Hang on, I gotta make this small again. If it's a long term portfolio, I'm just probably in both. I'm probably in the OOP too. So, long term portfolio is at 32% of the moment. And the GE position there is. La, 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 la. There it is. Well, um, it's pretty aggressive. We have, 30, we have 50 of the calls and 18 of the puts. Look, being the long-term portfolio, frankly, I, I, I'm not going to want to sell anything in 14. It's too low. Um, I haven't given up on them yet. So it's uh, to me, it's too low in the channel. I mean, obviously, the channel doesn't look very healthy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> too low in the channel. Well, it, it depends on what you call a channel, right? I, I need a bigger chart. Um, the problem is that here, here's a problem that a lot of people have when you look at a chart, though, is the GE that you're looking at now is not the same GE that was $27 or 30 bucks. That's not what GE is anymore. They sold off divisions. They don't have the stuff that made them a $30 company. So they're not coming back to 30. That's not happening. There's no 30, there's no 30 here. Um, how do I explain that? Um, like let's say Apple sold off their iPhone division and they don't make phones anymore. Still a computer company, still Apple but they don't make those phones. That's half their profits. Probably maybe more than half their profits, who knows? But let's say it's half their profits. So Apple stock would drop 50%. And they could say, well, we're going in a different direction. We're focusing more on services and more on the app stuff and more on Apple Pay. And we're gonna turn ourselves into this and that. And you can buy that and you can say, okay, great. But the bottom line is now, instead of having um, $50 billion in, in profit a year, they got 20, they got $25 billion in profit a year. And maybe, and you've got to be realistic about what you can expect them to do from $25 billion. That's what happened to GE. They spun off uh, several divisions, got cash, but they also have this huge underfunded pension fund. So pretty much all the cash they get from selling divisions is sucked up by the pension fund. Um, oh, excuse me. So anyway, so the bottom line is that this, this GE that survives isn't the same GE that was selling off divisions and making all that money back here. So they're not likely to make that much money next time. I do think that ultimately 18 to 20 is probably the right, the right range for them. And our trades reflect that. I think I think this is way too low. I think when they get back to 15, if they fail it, I'll be willing to sell some calls. So I'm hoping we get to 1750 before we have to start selling calls. But certainly, I think 14 is just silly. I think all you can do is buy trouble for yourself. Um, is that it's not worth it? Also, they don't pay enough. If we look at the um, the OOP, only only 11 percent right now. It's not very exciting. Um, the GE and the OOP is, <clears throat> yeah, it's the same deal. I mean, we have the 20 of the short puts, which we're going to have to eventually roll and double down anyway. And we have the, uh, when 2021 comes out, we're going to roll them. And we have the 13 calls, and we're just sitting on them. We're hoping they come back in price. Um, if we cover the 13 calls by selling 14 calls on GE, I mean, you can't just snap your fingers and make money because you feel like it. You have to have a realistic path to doing it. So let's say we sell the September 14 calls for 80 cents. Or oh, you're capping your game at 14, where you are now. 
So if you don't think GE is going to go more than 80 cents higher between now and September, why be in it at all? Then we should be folding the trade. That's a waste of money. And if you sell the 15s, you only get 35, 35 cents. It's, like, it's just not worth selling. Just on the chance that it gets better. Now, if the 15 calls become 80 cents, I'll be interested in selling it, or at least some. Because that's kind of worth our time. Because then we still have a buck to gain, plus another buck for the calls. But as it stands now, it's just too cheap. It's, it's a little bit ridiculously low, I think. Although, honestly, it's been so disappointing, it's hard to say. Um, how do you feel what happened with green coin? What happened with green coin that really killed it was um, the main the, one of the exchanges stopped listing them. One of the one of the ones they were heaviest traded on stopped listing them. Um, they they cut they cut it wasn't particularly green coin. They cut hundreds of coins and they stopped listing them. And green coin didn't make the cut for one that could stay because they had a low volume. And that left us with only like one exchange the green coins traded on. The volume dropped down to nothing. And everybody kind of lost interest. Now, that obviously all the cryptos collapsed, so that didn't help either. Um, but the bottom line is green coin is, is so thinly traded that it would take a huge effort to get it back to being traded again. And that being the case, the effort would be more expensive than just moving on to another coin. So we're uh, currently looking at other coins and thinking about it, but on the whole, I, I just think this whole crypto thing is kind of unraveling. So, you know, we, we of course, uh, at PSW Investments, we, of course, made a lot of money on green coin because we, well, actually, we didn't make the money on green coin particularly. We made the money on, on, on Bitcoin because we had to buy Bitcoins to, to buy the green coins with, and we what we did is we bought four Bitcoins, at $650 each back in the day, we used the Bitcoins to buy 150 million green coins. And, um, and those we're still sitting on. Um, at one point, they were worth, theoretically, they were worth uh, almost 1.5 million. They're worth like a dime each or a penny. Sorry. At one point, they were worth a penny each. So they were, they were theoretically worth 1.5 million, but good luck selling them. Greg tried to sell some, and there just wasn't enough demand to actually sell them. Um, so they said a penny, but, but, you know, you can always sell like a tiny, tiny amount for a penny. And then, then the price would start dropping rapidly. And so we, we just said, well, we'll hold on and see if anything good happens. Meanwhile, though, we only used two Bitcoins to buy the green coins. Our total investment in, in Bitcoins was 2,800 bucks. And while we held the Bitcoins, they went up to $20,000. Uh, we sold ours for about seventeen five each, so we collected thirty five thousand dollars on the green coins. So that's where our profit came from. Not from the, I'm sorry, on the big coins we made about thirty five thousand dollars. On the green coin we made nothing, uh, but but overall we we're plus thirty five thousand for the for the for the for our troubles. Um, we'd like we would love it if green coin came back, but the reality is. You know, I'm talking to people about green coin still, but because it's so thinly traded, it's got to start getting traded. I tried to get people to start trading it and using it uh, to buy memberships to fill stock world and stuff, but it just wasn't enough people to move the needle. And um, so I think we're probably going to be better off taking the money that we would spend promoting green coin and putting it into another coin that we feel we can have more of an effect with and that will be a little more liquid. And there are some very, there are some nicely liquid coins out there that are trading at very low prices. But again, I'm at the moment not looking to put any more money into that stuff because I think crypto might, you know, completely fall apart. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. All right, going to wrap this up shortly. Markets are still pretty low, but not terrible. Um, trade, active trader. No, actually, all the year is a little run up, getting a run up in the NASDAQ, getting a run up in the Dow again. Um, not the Dow, sorry, the S&P. So back to 2780. There's nothing exciting. All we, all we can do really is watch this and see what happens, though, and see how the trade thing unravels and see how the NATO meeting unravels 
and there's been lots of rumors and talk and back and forth, moving things. Then Trump goes through Russia to meet with Putin. So it's going to be talk, 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 talk. And it's going to be very, other than, you know, we'll just have to wait for earnings next week. Friday, we got some bank earnings. But realistically, we're not going to know anything until we start seeing some earnings reports coming and seeing what the reaction to that is. Because at least that's real. That's something you can hang your hat on. Um, all this stuff going on back and forth right now is speculation. Um, you can think the trade war is bad. You can think the trade war is good. There are people on both sides. But I think it's bad on the whole, but it's not going to be there. It'll take months until that's borne out. It takes a long time to realize what a mistake it was to do something. All right. Last couple of questions, and that will be a lot for the day. And there are no other questions. Okay, fantastic. I love that. Um, I hope I got my point across. So I was like, there, you know, there are so many good value trades that we can make all the time. I mean, all the time. There are 40, I forget, 46 trades or something like that in 10 months. That's four trades a month in the, uh, just, that was just the top trades. That's, that's probably a tenth of what we put out. Um, so, but even if you just did that, that's more, that's more trades than any rational person is going to put in a portfolio. You know, 40 trades is a lot of trades to manage. You don't need more than that. Um, you know, if you, if you can't figure out, <laughs> if you have 40 stocks and you can't figure out how to make money with your 40 stocks, then getting 80 stocks isn't going to fix it. <laughs> I want to be very clear about that strategically. Um, that, that's not how it works. More stocks isn't better. You need, you know, you want to have 20 to 40 trades. You shouldn't have more trades than every morning, every morning. You should be doing this, okay? With every single stock you have, you say H M N Y, and you say ah, down again. Then you go here, not there, there, and you go H M N Y, and you find the actual thing back, I guess. Yeah, there you go. And you look at the news and you say, okay, what's the news? It tells you 21 hours, 23 hours, so yesterday, whatever. All right, so what's the news today? Uh, public offering of stock in warrants. Um, trades down after initial pub initiating public offering. So they're selling more stuff. They're looting constantly. Um, they may not recover if they, obviously, they may not recover if the experiment is failing. Duh. But you see how they're being attacked because they put out an offering and immediately they're being attacked and saying they may go to zero, is about to go to zero. That's a strong statement, but apparently there's, there's no, you can't be, you, you can make strong statements like that, whether they're fact based or not, and just get people worried. And you get to be published in Yahoo Finance. Um, the rise and fall of movie pass. This thing has been printed over and over and over again all week long. It's like the fifth or sixth time I've seen the same article. Um, Delray Beach, Florida, this time. What the hell is that got to do anything? Um, Helios Matheson is saying 10% this morning. <clears throat> so, and that's Molly Fools. That's that's written by a robot, the Molly Fool stuff. So anyway, every day. Every stock you have, you should be reading those headlines and knowing what's going on. You should have the time in case something does happen. You should have the time to check it out and find out what's happening. And on every single day, you've got to know what you're going to do about it. You have to have a trading plan in place for every single stock you have. And you should know if you're on or off track for your trading plan. My trading plan for this stock is to buy more 10 cents. So I, I, I don't, when it goes down, to 17 cents or 18 cents, I'm not upset. I'm like, oh, good. I'm going to get to buy the stock I wanted at 10 cents. I, it's not a negative to me. We just, we waited, we waited a month or two to fill the 20 cents that we wanted to double down at. So it took a long time for us to get to, get to the 20 cent level so we could buy more stock. So now we have more stock and it goes down to 18. I'm, I'm waiting for 10. Now, when it's at 10, if it goes to five, I'll start to get upset. But right now, it's just not, it's not, it's the plan was to buy more. Anyway, so every stock you should have, you should be looking at your charts, 
to see if there's anything there, if it looks like it's breaking down. You want to be looking at, and not just breaking down, what if it's topping out? Then you got to say, you got to be realistic there too, and say maybe it's time to take profit. Like I said, on the, uh, on the, um, we can purchase metal. It made so much money now that there's no point in staying in it. Um, uh, what was that other one? The, the tenant healthcare, THC, um, also made so much money. We had to cash it out. It just made too much money. There was no point in staying in it. It was ridiculous. Um, it, you know, and I mean ridiculous. Like we have a spread. The spread's ninety percent in the money. It can only make ten percent more if we sit on it for eighteen more months. What's the point? We have a million ways to make eight to make ten percent in eighteen months. Now, you know, we certainly don't need to do it by tying up a lot of money in that thing. Um, and I, I love the stock, but it, it unfortunately had a great run, so we get rid of it and, and wait for something else that's on sale. But if you have more stocks and you have time every day to read the news and go over the stock and look at the, and check your position and make sure you're on track, and if you don't have an organized trading plan for every single stock, like if you go around portfolio reviews, I don't do it every time, but every once in a while, because it's such a it takes me forever. Um, in our portfolio reviews, which are always under the virtual portfolio tab, and um, in the, in the review, I tend to say, hmm. well, not this one. All right, sorry. What was that one? Anyway, every once in a while, I'll talk about not only whether we're on track or not on track of the position, but I'll talk about the total potential return of the position because that's my trading plan. I know how much money I expect to make from every single position, and I know whether the position is on track or off track. And, and then I know also how all these positions balance together in the portfolio. So, you know, some, sometimes some will make money, sometimes others will make money. They shouldn't all make money at the same time. You shouldn't be all pushed into the same direction at once because you can go the other direction at once just as fast. Some things you make money, other things don't. When tenant health care goes, to, to goes through a high level, I cash it out. We can purchase metal, I cash it out. Then I have to look at the whole portfolio and think about how the balance of my portfolio has now been affected. So I got rid of a health care company, I got rid of a, of a metal company. Do I want to buy a health care company to replace it? No, they're all too expensive right now. But I do like Gilead. So I think Gilead is health care-ish and it's something that I think will improve. You know, Pfizer is getting a little bit cheaper because they're having a fight with Trump and they're cutting their prices and whatever. That's one to look at because Pfizer is a reliable long-term play. I want to replace, if I had a good balance before, I want to maintain my balance. And maintain my balance means picking up a replacement stock in the same sector that's a better bargain than the one that I got rid of. But again, 20 to 40 positions is a lot to manage. 40 is certainly a lot to manage. And my our, our four our, our five member portfolios have like uh well over a hundred positions, maybe, maybe just way too many. Anyway, it's like a hundred. So I'm killing myself managing those. Um it's too many. And I, you know, even if you're an expert trader, you don't want to have that much. It's like you want to have 20 to 40 positions, manage them. And I'm not counting short puts. Short puts are just positions we want to take if they get cheaper. So in the long-term portfolio, we're constantly selling. Every month we sell, uh, generally we try to sell a $5,000 and $4,000 short put. And that way we've always got 50,000 plus working on short puts. And you see how these profits add up very nicely because we're always selling. And all I'm saying here is I sell alleys at 27, I sell the $25 put for $250. So it's $2250. So if Ali, I'm saying I'm willing to buy Ali for five dollars off the current price. Berkshire is at $189. I sell the $170 put for eight bucks. So call it $160. I'm willing to buy Berkshire if it drops. I'm willing to buy Berkshire for $29 cheaper. That's 20% below the current price. So all these puts are, are me saying, if the stock gets really cheap, I'll buy it. If it doesn't get really cheap, I'll keep this money. 
So I don't consider those positions per se. Those are possible positions down the road. These are what I mean by positions, the ones down here. And in this case, in the long-term portfolio, we have 33 of these and we have four of those. So that's basically as many positions as I really want in the long-term portfolio. I don't want to add a new position unless I'm going to take one off the table. There's plenty, there's too many positions here, or, or not too many, but, but enough that I don't want to mess around with it too much. But what I was saying then, by the way, is that the top trades alone are more trades than you would need to keep you busy all year long. And they're all great, great trades. And they're not risky, and we're not chasing momentum stocks. And we are almost always picking stocks that we're very happy to own for the long term. There's not like, there's not a lot of speculation in that portfolio. It's all about value investing. And, and I think that, you know, if you want to find something new in this market, that's a good thing to do is look for these value plays and put your cash into those. Don't put your cash into chasing the fads because that's where the market bubble can pop and kill you. All right. Any last second questions? No, there's not. Fantastic. So we're going to end this thing pretty much right on time. Thanks for coming, everybody. We'll do it again next week. All right. Take care.